Okay. I'll ask uh, Deacon Ray to uh, give us our opening blessing. Let us all pray. Our Father, we thank you this evening for this great gathering of minds and people who are interested in your word. We thank you for their travel here this evening and hopefully to get back safely this, after our service. Bless us all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lives with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Everyone should uh, have your uh, syllabus. Um, do you have uh, anybody need a copy of the syllabus? I do. Uh, Janet, do you have the syllabus uh, copies uh, out there? Maybe I, maybe I have some extras here. No, I don't. Uh, you know, from last week, the syllabus. Uh, we'll we'll get those to you in a minute. Do you do you want to grab those? And I've got one copy here. Uh, yeah, Marilyn, you, Marilyn. Marilyn, do you have the syllabuses from last week, the stack that was back there? At home. At home? No, we need them. Okay. So if you want to run copies of that. How many do we need? Wait, wait a minute. One, Maybe two, three, four. Right. There was a big stack of them back there. Here, let me see. Okay, why don't you run over and uh, make a uh, copy. I'm sorry, these are from last time. Okay. <laughs> we'll get that to you in a minute, and uh, that's not a problem because I want to just uh, talk about something else while we're doing it. Um, just a couple of um, uh, notes. Uh, we've kind of finalized the schedule for spring. Uh, for Academies uh, 2 and 3, this is Academy 1, during the 1920 academic year. And so the next Academy will be in March, uh, every Tuesday in March. And that, that is before the Easter cycle, so we're in good shape there. So that'll be the Tuesdays. And Father Caney is going to lecture during that uh, time, doing a detailed look at the Old Testament. And uh, I think that ought to be interesting. He's going to try to take every book of the Old Testament and, and look at the, uh, the meaning and the uh, teachings of each of those books. Now, if those of you who have been with us over the uh, several years know that about three years ago, we did a survey of the Old Testament with uh, David Campius, Pastor Campius, who looked at just the major themes of the Old Testament, but didn't look at each book individually. And so, uh, Father Caney's going to, Pastor Caney's going to look at each book and give us the sort of summary of each book of the Old Testament. That's particularly important to us as, as Christians because the, uh, everything that we have is based on that foundation of the Old Testament. I mean, we are in many ways Jewish Christians. Uh, the Abrahamic, that's why we have a Bible with both Old and New Testament in it. And it's not just exclusively New Testament. And really to understand the New Testament really well uh, is to look at those references because it's always referring back to Old Testament texts and prophecies like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so on. The whole business of the Messiah and the concept of the Messiah has to be grounded in the Old Testament to really understand how that all uh, you know, came to be in the New Testament. Jesus also, as you know, in the New Testament, uh, they trace the lineage of Jesus back to David and so on. So we, we really do need to understand that, that history and the tradition there to really fully understand our own, our own faith. And as I mentioned before, you know, we're part of the Abrahamic family, the three great religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all based on a common, common background, common heritage, and uh, so, uh, to understand the Old Testament uh, is, and of course, as you've heard me say often, uh, Jesus only knew the Old Testament. The New Testament was not written until 30, 40 years after his death, so he didn't know any of the Gospels, any of the Epistles, any, anything. So what he knew was the teachings of the Torah, and you remember that one incident in the Bible that's recorded where Jesus is reading from the great scrolls 
And people say he read with such authority that it just amazed at the people how a young person would have that kind of wisdom and insight. Obviously, he's reading from the, the Old Testament texts, or as we know it is the Hebrew Bible. So that'll be the uh, Tuesdays in March, uh, with the same kind of format, uh, either one or two lectures, uh, reading week, and two, two lectures. Uh, and then in uh, April, because that's the Holy Week and Easter come into April there, we then generally skip to May, and the weather's nice in May, and we'll have uh, another academy, the Spring Academy, and uh, that will be on, uh, on worship. And so uh, part, of the, part of the course is going to be taught by myself and, and also Deacon Ray, who's a musician, and uh, so I think he's going to get to the organ and, uh, and teach us some things about hymnody and, and some, some history of someone. We, it's, it, it hasn't been tacked in stone, so it could be something else. You know, he could be teaching us calliope playing. Yes. Uh, but at this juncture, uh, uh, it, it'll, be, uh, it'll be a good academy. And then, of course, the last uh, week of the academy in May, we have the famous potluck dinner and graduation that we all look forward to. So, if you look at your calendars now as you're planning out 2020, reserve the Tuesdays in March and the Tuesdays in May. And although that seems like a long ways away, it's just a stone's throw. It's just one cold, snowy, snowball, <laughs> snowball <laughs> from, from now. So that, that helps uh, put you on track. Um, while the syllabuses are being uh, copied for you, uh, let me just uh, pass out uh, uh, two things, and I think those of you who have read the text uh, know what these uh, stand for. Right, would you pass would you pass these out? And this will help us get back into the theme of where we, where we ended last time. I hope you're enjoying the text. Uh, it's really a good book. It's extraordinarily easy to read, and I've just had rave reviews from you on the book. And the stories, uh, some of the stories even brought some tears to my eyes, like the little boy that was doing the bar mitzvah but couldn't speak, and how his mother uh, spoke for him. And uh, that, that's a great story. And there's just some wonderful examples of people doing uh, doing meritorious service. Now the main thing about the book is that it's a workbook, as I told you, not only to read, but actually to use. And so the to-do list that's in there uh, is your, always your assignment for this class, because those things help prompt you into thinking about what you might do to accomplish those, uh, those things. Um, those are different, you know. You should have two slips when you finish up here. <laughs> so the leftovers here, if you hand those to me, and then we'll be ready to go. Okay, everyone should have the two slips now. You need two. One uh, where it's the ashes one, and the other one is the created ones. Do you have the two slips? Okay. Uh, do you remember the story or what he does with the introduction of why these slips are important? Um, it brings us back to our discussion of last time, and that is to remember the main theme throughout this course, and, and actually as God reveals it in the Bible is, that we are created in the image of God. And that's where we start everything from. And that the wonders of creation of God is twofold. Number one is that he makes all of creation, and then he brings as the last uh, part of creation, the highest point of creation, the development of man and women, humankind. And therefore, the entire creation was meant for men and women to appreciate, to love, and to, to thrive within. And so the creation wasn't just something that God did without any purpose. If you think about it, 
if if all if all that he had made was just made and there were no people there, uh, it would just be a sort of a zoo, and that would be about it, and no real meaning or purpose. So God, from the very first part, uh, presumed to want to have his image himself reflected in human beings, and then to take advantage of this great creation that he would make, and then allow men, by the, by the gift of free will that we talked about, which is the, one of the greatest gifts that human beings have been given by God, and that is that we share a certain divinity of creative abilities, and by so doing then, we become co-creators, or at least partners with God in the further development of the creation after he had sort of rested. So, if you remember last time I said in the seven days of creation and then he takes a rest, but not everything was done. And once human beings were brought on the scene, one of the first tasks is that he gave to Adam, who is the representative of, of human life, uh, he told him, now you name all the animals. So you, now, you know, I've done my work now. Now I'm, I'm sort of passing off some things for you to do, which was very significant. Because as you name something, you actually are investing yourself in that part of creation. Yeah. Now, we, when we talk about created in his image, right. we mean that we are created in the image that he created in us. Right? That's correct. Yeah. Right. We don't know what God looks like. Right. right. And it's blasphemy to, as, as, I, right. as you know, within Jewish tradition, to ever picture God in any way. Uh, in fact, the great commandment says, you shall make no images of me of any sort, because everything you make will be incorrect. It isn't like Michelangelo on top of the Sistine ceiling, taking right. his finger and touching man and creating, putting life in man, mm -hmm. and God is pictured as the old man, the wise old man with the long right. gray hair. This is something that on earth that we right. can only conceive of. That's called anthropomorphism. In other words, what we're doing is we're projecting our image on God. Actually, we're creating God in our image when we do that. And uh, that's a very childish thing of which we all did. I mean, you know, when I was in Sunday school, I'm sure that if my teacher had asked me, I would have drawn an old man with a beard and white hair and all that. I mean, that just seems the right thing to do. But, rec but to remember, that that has no bearing whatsoever. And that's why the Hebrew scriptures have no description of God whatsoever. In fact, any time that any human being gets close to being in the presence of God, such as Moses, God shields Moses from seeing him. It puts his hand so that Moses cannot see God as he's passing by, remember? Or God appears in the burning bush. Well, you don't see an old man in that burning bush, it's just the power of God there. Or he's in the wind and the rain, and he's in the storms and, and so on. The power of God is both, uh, uh, is a force, it's the creative force of the universe which has no human likeness. So, it's a terrible error that people make when they think that God has two eyes, two ears, two hands, two feet, and the uh, athlete's foot. You know, I mean, uh, it, it's just a total uh, kind of a, what I would say, it's actually close to blasphemy. Uh, because what you're doing is you're projecting your image on God. This is why we can't imagine or approach, approach the physical God. Right. It's kind of like a shield. It's the Bart right. idea of there's a shield between the Creator right. and the creation. We can never approach the Creator because... Correct. That shield. Correct. Well, under in a sort of philosophical way, if we were talking mm -hmm. about philosophy, nothing that is created can ever comprehend yeah. the Creator. Cool. In other words, if you fully knew everything about God, every dimension, every aspect, mm -hmm. to be able to picture or to put God into some sort of a box, then you would be God yourself, because you exactly. would be equal to God. So, since we're never equal to God, we will never be able to comprehend the fullness of what God is like. And so, anytime we project mm -hmm. our human uh, kind of concepts on God, we get it wrong. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is we can, we can find the, the evidences of God 
in those things which we know are God qualities, such as goodness, mercy, justice, uh, love, compassion. All those things, obviously, are God-like qualities. And how we know that is because we look at the opposite of the God-like qualities. Hatred, warfare, uh, discord, uh, you know, jealousy, anger. And we know that that can't be part of God because it is a, you know, it's atypical of what God would be like. So I see the syllabuses have syllabi arrived. Uh, so that's where we were last week talking about the, the concept of God. And then we come to, as he does in the book, saying that it's important for you and human beings to have uh, two, two reminders of how we need to relate to a creator. And the first is that we need to put two of these little slips in our pockets. And uh, remember, this is the discussion he has in the book about the mirror. And he said, it's a good thing to look in the mirror, and what do you see there? And of course, his original, he starts out by saying, I see somebody that just got out of bed, yeah. my hair is all a mess, <coughs> and I have... Uh, you know, swollen eyes and everything. I'm not looking at anything great. Um, but it, but then, then he goes on and says, what I want you to understand is that when you see, thanks, thanks, Jerry, that when you see yourself in the mirror, appreciate what you're looking at, not the physical aspects of, you know, uh, getting bald or, you know, getting gray or wrinkles, but to see what God sees. And what you see when you see in a mirror is you see a creation of God. That is, every one of us has been blessed by the touch of the Creator. And so, he says to us, um, now there's two ways you can deal with that. You can, you can uh, take a sort of a negative view sometimes and you see that uh, there's a lot of things that we do in life that we don't do very well, and that we make errors and omissions, sinfulness. We fall from the image. We don't reflect God fully in life because of our own human frailties, uh, so, you know, jealousies or uh, misjudgments, um, one-upmanship, uh, pridefulness, you know, all the seven deadly sins come into play. And when you see that, uh, you tend to pull out of, of, of this image and you, you diminish the potential which God sees in you. So that's, that's something you have to work, worry about. The other thing is to be too prideful. To say, I'm the best, I'm the greatest, no one ever did, I'm the best president that ever came down the pipe. And, uh, or that I'm the, I'm the, you know, the cat's meow, or nobody ever did it or could do it better than I. Or I'm the finest pianist that ever uh, sat behind the keyboard. And, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Steinway should be, should be pleased that I am rendering him a, a, the honor of playing one of his instruments. And when you get that too much of that pride that goes before a fall, as they say, you get the pride, then you have the other, the other one in your pocket. So, when you get to be too conceited, too self-centered, too much believing that you have all the answers and that you can't be taught anything, and that certainly God, is, God doesn't have anything to teach you, you're, you're perfected, then you reach in your pocket, uh, the old rabbi said, and you pull out this one and say, I am but dust and ashes, and remind yourself of human frailties, and also the fact that we have a limited lifespan and our days are numbered, and lest you get too prideful, get your, get your act together and get a balance in your life. On the other hand, when you get a negative kind of thing going in your life, when people say, oh, you'll never be anything, or, you know, uh, I, I wish I had somebody better than you doing the job, but I guess you could do it. Uh, or you do the job until I find somebody better, or if you kind of feel put down in life, then you reach under your pocket and you take out the other slip and say, for my sake, the world was created. 
and know that you are an object of God's affection and his abiding love. And that he is not wasting his time when he's dealing with you. Quite the contrary. He is in your life in a unique and ever-present way. God is never absent. God has claimed you through the, through the covenant of baptism. To, and he has sealed his covenant with you forever. And that means no matter whether you're at the highest mountains or the depths of the sea, like Psalm 139 says, if I go to the highest mountains, God, you're there. Uh, and amazingly, God, if I go to the depths of the ocean, uh, well, you're there too. And where can I flee from your presence, O God, the psalmist says? For there is nowhere in heaven and earth where God will abandon you, his child, for you are declared forever mine. And we said last time, that's the word Emmanuel that we use at Christmas. God with us. And it's a 24-7 situation. Last time I said, you know, there's never a time that you could do something which God says, okay, you, you know, uh, you, you, that's the last straw. Um, see ya. Uh, don't bother calling me because I'm not going to answer your calls anymore. Uh, you know, don't, don't, don't bother me because you're a hopeless, endless case. Well, that may be what some people say about some people in life, but that's never what God says. Because God always sees in you potential. God always sees what maybe you don't even see in yourself. God sees a redemptive quality within you. Something that says, I will never give up because I know what you can be. I know because I've made you, I've dreamed you, and I've sent you here for a purpose, and therefore, I know that even though you don't realize your potential, I, God, do. And you are never a hopeless case. And that, as I say to my people on Sunday, now that's very good news indeed. It really is, because it says that we're the object of God's affection. We're the apple of his eye. <coughs> and we therefore have worth. Now, do we live up to the expectations of God all the time? No, we don't. But God also knows that too, that when he gave us human freedom, he also knew that there would be a downside to that, that sometimes we would use bad judgment. And for varieties of reasons, we will make bad choices. And so with that, evil came into the world, or bad things happen often to good people, or bad things happen to people in general, because you can't control what somebody else's bad judgment is. So you're driving down the highway and somebody drinks too much and they use bad judgment, they get behind the wheel and they smash into the side of your car. Did God will that? Absolutely not. But we also said, and this is important always to remember, that God is not a puppet master. He's not, he's not controlling every moment of our lives. If he were, human freedom would be taken away. But to give us that quality, which is God's, that he wants to share with us, the ability to make choice and to make good things and to put behind us a good track record, God then has to say, I've got to accept that certain bad things may happen, which are out of out of control because otherwise it would be a meaningless world if God just simply was pulling every string every moment so now we ended by talking about how do you how do you cope with that when when certain things happen that are unfortunate or disastrous you cope with it by remember that God never abandons you even in the negative circumstances of your life in fact, sometimes it is in the negatives of our lives uh, that we discover God even more real in our lives than ever before. Because I think there's a tendency of human beings to live in such a way as if I can handle it. Uh, God, I don't need you. I, you know, I'm, I'm doing fine on my own until the reality strikes, strikes at some point when uh, you know, you really needed help and you didn't ask. And unfortunately, some people never get religion or never think about God until some disaster strikes. And then they, they, they try every other option. 
And then at the end they said, what do I have to lose? I'll try to God. And sadly, that God should have been in the first place, not at the end place. But even then, God still listens and says, okay, I know, I know, uh, so let's start and let's pick up the pieces and let's find out how we can work through this. So you always have a coach, you always have a mentor. The question is, do you, do you have that mentor and that coach in your life in such a way is that your entire life is walking in accord with the God who has made you? And that's what salvation, I mean, that's what the sanctification is partially about. Walking righteously with God. How to, how to center one's life in such a way by the power of the Holy Spirit that we really find God is so real in our lives that he no longer is a mystery of the universe, but that he is a constant companion and your best friend. Um, and that's what God wants to do. So God says to you, share with me all the experiences of your life. So at good times, uh, God is expecting to share in your joy. And he is thrilled uh, when uh, you come to him and, and share with him just terrific things that have happened and wonderful, wonderful things that have come your way. Knowing that also God is in your life changing and working situations to bring that goodness. Um, I mentioned last time and, and often remember what Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and that you may have it in abundance, meaning he expects you to live and have a good life. And he wants to be there helping you live that good life. So that's the business of living in the image of God. Not to get too self-inflated. If you do, then pull out of your pocket this. I'm, but remember, I'm just dust and ashes. And, but if you ever get down and you, you're, you're hard on yourself or other people are hard on you, uh, pull out the other one that says, remember, for my sake, the world was created. And that, those are really good things to do. So, now let's come to number four on our, on our list of the syllabus. We talked about the essentials of living the faith, so I've sort of summarized that for you tonight. Justification and sanctification we're working down through. Now, understanding works. Uh, one of the things that has occurred within the Western tradition, particularly in the Reformed tradition, I mean, in the, in the time of post-Reformation, uh, is this uh, sort of reticence or this sort of um, uh, sense that we're frightened uh, that, that works may become too important in our lives. And, and some people say, all you, need, all you need is faith. Just live by faith and you'll be okay. And I would agree with that. Um, but the question is, what do we do with the faith we have? And the reformers, at the time of the Reformation, were making a sort of course correction in the church, where during the Middle Ages and previous, there had come to be a terrific emphasis on, on meritorious works. And, and that means that um, if, for example, you did something that uh, you shouldn't have done, you yelled at your dog, you, you know, you kicked your dog or whatever, and so you've, uh, then you have a sort of remorse for that, and so you, you kind of want to get that absolved from your conscience. And you, you know that God wouldn't be very happy with that, treating your animal like that. So, so what do I do? And the, the church has sort of come up with sort of uh, formulas, uh, such as saying 10 Hail Marys. Or, um, you know, you cut somebody off in the traffic line. You better say a Hail Mary, you know. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed be the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. So, uh, or, or giving. Giving had gotten to be corrupted too, so that you, you paid to have your sins absolved. You know, like um, you have a toothache and you go into your dentist and, and uh, the, the dentist removes the tooth and you feel a lot better and at the end he presents you a bill. You, you pay for the service. And, and there had been sort of a development within church tradition of 
of paying for uh, the absolution of sins. Um, part of the scandal at Luther's time was the building of St. Peter's in Rome, that great, wonderful cathedral that we're glad is there. But to build that uh, took enormous amount of money and resources. And so uh, we're coming into the Sunday of the Reformation, and it was uh, part of the Lutheran tradition and the Reformers later on that they were um, scandalized by the fact that the, that the Pope and, and the Rome, Roman Church at that time, which was the one church, uh, was, was intimidating uh, their members and people that were basically uneducated uh, in, the, in this time, 1500s. Uh, so much so that, that uh, when, they, when they knew that they had made some mistakes and they went to confession, uh, to have their sins absolved, uh, they would have to do penance, uh, which isn't a bad thing. In other words, trying to make amends for the mistakes you've made. But, unfortunately, there was also that business that, well, if you, know, uh, if you, if you put some money in the pot, or the poor box, or in the collection plate, uh, we'll just sort of expunge, we'll clean up your act, and, and we'll, you, know, you, can, you can feel that God's not going to hold that against you because you, you, know, you put uh, five bucks in the, in the plate. Uh, even worse were the sale, selling of indulgences, which was a big thing in the Reformation, in which uh, there was a belief that the people that had died and gone to heaven before you were, were really in purgatory. There was this concept of sort of an intermediate step between earthly life and heavenly life. I mean, it made sense in the way it was formulated that nothing impure can be in the presence of God. So, if you have an un if you have unresolved issues in your life, sinfulness, and you die before you can resolve those those sins on the earthly plane, uh, certainly you can't be received into heaven carrying all that baggage with you. And so, therefore you need to have a time period in which you are washed clean or you're prepared for entrance into the heavenly courts because certainly no defiled uh, people can enter so if you've been you know if you you're carrying all this sinfulness and as the liturgy said if you say you're you know you're uh, uh, if you say you have no sins you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you that's what the liturgy said. And it's right on, because there's no one, and I, I ask this question every, every session, because I'm hoping somebody will eventually will raise their hand. I well, said, isn't this a, is, a, 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 in, in the Reformation, wasn't part of that Luther's misinterpretation of uh, the book of James? Uh, well, uh, uh, he, at, at the beginning. Yeah, uh, Luther did not like James's mm -hmm. book, because he thought it was too works-oriented. However, that's been pretty much debunked because James was writing, James says, faith without works. It's not, he's not making an emphasis that works alone can save you. But he said, show me a person who uh, claims they have faith but they don't have any works. Well, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, if you're a person of faith, you will have works. You will produce good works. So, partially in response to corrupted doctrine or corrupted message, uh, Luther and the Reformers uh, sort of, you know, the pendulum swings sometimes in, in too far in one direction as it swings the other. You know, it's interesting in our political climate, you know, the pendulum is swinging one way now and then we're looking at the 2020 election or beyond, will the pendulum still be out here or will it swing the other direction? And when you hear Bernie Sanders, you see a complete, uh, complete swing to the other side of the Trump, which is on this side. So you have, a, you know, two rather extremes between this. And, and literally in the Middle Ages time, you had those kind of extremes that were setting in so that the reformers being so worried that people would mistake the fact that you cannot buy your way into heaven no matter how much you pay, and you can't work your way into heaven no matter how good you work. 
So Luther was hounded by this, you know, that he, he never felt as devoted his life was as an Augustinian priest and monk, whether or not he had ever said enough Hail Marys, whether he not had celebrated enough Masses, and done as enough good things, whether he, how he stood in God's, in God's eyes. And he was hounded by this, by this feeling of, of insufficiency. Meaning, uh, you know, I, 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 what do I, what can I do more? You know, as I said uh, last time, I said, uh, my students often ask if they have a B, B in the course, or a B plus. They'd say, Professor, uh, what can I do to earn an A? I, you know, I'm a B plus. It has to only be just a little jump to get to that A minus. And uh, so, uh, can I, can I do something? Can I write an extra term paper? Can I do this? The same thing in religious thinking, uh, people were of the concept that if they do just a little bit more, uh, if they work a little harder, they say more prayers, they attend more masses, they do this, they do this, they put more money in the plate, uh, you know, God probably wasn't very satisfied with five, I'll put ten in this week, but then, you know, I, I don't know whether ten's adequate, maybe God expected me to put twenty in, so I'll put twenty in this week, now I kind of like that thinking, but, you know, but... You know what I'm saying in a humorous way. The fact is that in the end, uh, the, as you read the texts and the preachings, the teachings, uh, you can never do enough to earn your way into heaven. But that doesn't mean you don't do anything. And that's what happened as part of the bad legacy of the Reformation, is that people got into the sort of idea of so much free grace which there is, I mean, thank goodness there is, that God is graceful, and because of God's free offering of grace, he will accept us even in spite of all our flaws. And that's the atonement, and that's the business of Jesus standing in our stead and justifying us. But then there were some people that says, well, you know, if I'm saved strictly by grace alone, uh, then I guess uh, it doesn't make any difference what I do because, you know, you can make one of those deathbed confessions at the end and, you know, everything will be, you know, swept, swept away. So in between the extremes of the pendulum, there needs to be kind of an understanding that exactly what James was getting at, and Paul actually was too, that faith, that is, to confess one's faith or to confess one's uh, uh, allegiance to Christ must be there. But if there's no evidence that Christ has moved within your heart and mind, no evidence that you are different than anybody else, no difference from you that, that hates the Christ or, or works against the church or against everything we preach, if your life is reflecting exactly the same thing from the outside, somebody looking in say, oh, I can't under, you know, they claim to be a Christian, but they cuss people out in the parking lot. Uh, and if, if there's no moral uh, difference, more, you know, difference of, of, of the feeling that the Christ is really conquering within our heart, that is, or we are being sanctified or purified in this life, or moving to the righteous life, if there's no, uh, no evidence of that, then it's a fraud. You're claiming something that you don't believe. You're living under a false, false option. And this is what James was saying. Faith, without the evidence of faith, without being able to point that you have made specific moral improvement, is, is a lie. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a joke. So, that brings us to this course, of course. Of course, of course. <laughs> and that is that the sanctification means that we are to be making some faith development of our lives that are going to be reflected in how we live, how we speak, how we bear, and what we do with our lives. Recognizing this image of God that we've been created for in the first place, and then saying, but that image can be dulled or are marred, or fogged over, or hidden, if we do not have the Christ which is reflected through our words and our deeds. 
Now, the caution and footnote is, of course, we can never do enough to earn our way in, and we still are dependent on grace. But God is going to look, and, and the judgment will be, how faithful we, were we, and what track record we leave behind. Now, that was the exercise we did last week. When we looked at our lives from the reverse, we wrote our, by, uh, by our uh, obituaries with the intention to say, here's what I would like my life to reflect in the end. Here's what I would like people to see me as. And m most of you wrote those things which would be uh, uh, obvious, that we want to be known as a caring person. We want, to, we want to be known as somebody that went the extra mile. We want to be known as somebody that was a person of faith, that lived out our faith, was not quick to judge, was terribly forgiving, uh, unbelievably understanding, someone that you could always come to and would never turn you away, no matter whether you disagreed with them or not, but they were willing to listen and to consider you a valuable person, a child of God. A person who would never see race, but would always see the reflection of God in the person that they encountered. Would never work out of, the, out of prejudice or uh, of, of arrogance. Would never see a poor person as a failure, but would see them needing compassion and a helping hand. Seeing our success not solely as my doing, but that that I was able to be successful in, in the fact that God, I, I realized what God expected of me. Uh, that I live my life in gratitude. That is, that I don't take anything for granted. And that I consider everything that comes my way a gift of God. And acknowledge God in everything I do in my life. The ability, the ability to speak, the ability to lead worship, the ability to give a decent sermon now and then, uh, the ability to lecture, the ability to have dreams and thoughts. Each of you have those within you, and at the end of our lives, this is what we want to be remembered for. And then to remember that worldly things, in the end, have virtually no value. Remember in the book, there was that wonderful thing about the, the Jewish burial shroud that has no pockets. Do you remember that? That was a fabulous illustration, meaning you can't take anything with you. There's nothing. You're just wrapped and dropped in the hole. What you, what you take with you is that relationship with God, ultimately, that has been nurtured over an entire lifetime. And in the memories of those who remember you as the person which God would wish you to be remembered for. So, so works become the way in which we begin to see that the world has been given to us to be a steward of, and that everybody's life, including the creation, is part of our, the expectation of God in our lives. So what we do, we should do to the finest abilities of our abilities. You don't slop through uh, an organ piece on Sunday morning. God expects better of you. Uh, do we make mistakes? Absolutely. Do we fumble stuff up? Yes. But if the effort and the intention has been to do it the best we can, that's what God expects of us. Everything in life should be done thinking about how it affects somebody else. Now, Mike's working in the, in the supermarket. Your smile to someone there, or when somebody asks you a question, or when you're doing your work, is doing God's work. You are lifting somebody up by the attitude. If you're, a, you know, if you're an SOB, when somebody comes and asks you a question, that also is doing the devil's work. What you want to do is you want people to leave thinking, Boy, they have the nicest employees in that store. 
or boy, I, I'm glad I went there today because I was feeling kind of crummy when I went in there, but I saw Mike and his infectious smile, and he helped me, and my day has been made better. Now, you don't think that's God's work? Absolutely, it's God's work. So, no one is here by accident. Everyone is here in life as the intention of God. Therefore, that's why God takes a personal interest in you. Just as you take a personal interest in your children. You don't just, you don't just have a child and then say, okay, you're on your own, fine, see ya. I mean, you might feel that way sometimes with some kids. But the point is that no matter what they do, where they go, or whatever, they are always in your mind and heart and thoughts. Same with you, with God. No matter where you are, where you go, what you do, you are always in the thoughts of God. And God, like a helping parent, is always there to be a consultant, to be a resource, to be an extra strength, to be a confidant, to be there to help and aid, and to, when you call God into your life, to be a fabulous companion on this journey of life. And this is what the book is about. This is what we're talking about with works, with salvation, with sancti the sanctification. And this is where we are tonight as we take our break for a gift of God, which is called popcorn. From the fields of popcorn. Yeah. <laughs>